Jesus speaking in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Thanks for sharing that reading with us, Brent. Uh, before we get into the lesson this morning, let me just share a few things with you, one of which involves a loss in our church family here. Uh, Dorothy Stutz passed away early yesterday morning, and uh, she had been in uh, hospice care for a while at the nursing home in Bixby. And uh, Jimmy will not be meeting with the funeral home until tomorrow, and so it will be at least tomorrow afternoon before we know exactly when that funeral will be. It may be as late as Friday because of some family members that, that will be coming in. If you can assist uh, with singing for that service, again, it's a little hard to predict at this point uh, when it might be. It could be Friday, could be earlier. If you wouldn't mind calling the office in the morning after 8.30, letting them know that uh, you would be available Depending on what time the, the funeral ends up being, that would be greatly appreciated. I know Jimmy would appreciate that very much. Continue to pray for him uh, in, this, in this time of loss. As uh, Lee mentioned, we do have several who are away this morning because of mission trips, both domestically and foreign. We've got the youth group in um, Conifer, Colorado. We've got a large team in Ukraine. And uh, so please be praying for them and the success of their trips. Next Sunday, the 30th, we'll have an opportunity to do something that we haven't done in a while, and that's have a congregational fellowship meal. It seems like other things have been going on on, on fifth Sundays, so we always enjoy those times of being together. I think the menu is just sandwiches and desserts, so please plan on, on staying for that time of fellowship. There'll be a brief devotional service over in the OC immediately after that. And uh, Nathaniel Michael, who is our preaching intern this summer, We'll be preaching both this evening. Uh, we encourage you to be back at uh, 5 o'clock for that service. Nate's message is going to be out of the 42nd Psalm. Nate's going to be preaching next Sunday morning as well, as well as doing the uh, lesson in the afternoon devotional. What's the use of having a preaching intern unless you put them to work? and uh, have, have them share some lessons. So Nate's doing a tremendous job, and I appreciate very much the effort that he is putting into all aspects of this internship, but including preparation of several lessons that he'll be sharing with us this summer. We find Jesus in our text this morning in a place that's not really foreign to him. He's at the, the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. And that might be a little surprising to you based on what Jesus sometimes says about Pharisees. Uh, when he speaks in stereotypes, when he speaks in generalities, when he speaks with this broad sweeping brush about their immature, unspiritual, ungodly attitudes and behavior and hypocrisy and, and double standards, uh, it might surprise you that Jesus would be in the home of a Pharisee. And yet he loves Pharisees just as much as he loves anyone else. He's going to die for Pharisees just as much as he dies for anyone else. He wants their hearts to be touched and to be turned and to be drawn close to God just like he wants everybody else's hearts to. So just because he often speaks sharply with condemnation and with judgment, they're not really worse sinners than anyone else. They need salvation through him just like everybody else is going to. And so this is actually the third time in Luke's gospel that you find Jesus in the home of, of one of the Pharisees. Back in chapter 7, 
A guy named Simon, who was a Pharisee, invited Jesus over for a meal, and Jesus went. He's not one to turn down invitations, no matter where they come from. You remember on that occasion, Simon is appalled. Simon is offended that Jesus allows this woman who was reputed to be a sinner to touch him in such a way as she anointed his feet. Back in chapter 11, we find Jesus again at the home of a Pharisee who is surprised, shocked, offended that Jesus doesn't wash his hands ceremonially according to the traditions of the elders. On both of those occasions, Jesus is going to have to challenge their narrow thinking, their traditional thinking, their requirements of men kind of thinking that they have bound as requirements as if they were from God on other people. Sadly, today is not going to be any exception. Uh, Jesus is going to have to address uh, some issues that involve immature thinking, ungodly thinking. So he goes to the home of, of this Pharisee on the Sabbath day for a meal. So this is sort of like what we would consider Sunday lunch. Not eating out, but you remember when Sunday lunch was at home? Uh, when mom or grandma cooked and, and you ran into somebody at, at church services and you said, hey, come, come have lunch for us, and you actually had Sunday lunch, a home-cooked meal at home. I know that some of us still do that, but maybe not as much as we once did. Uh, this was a big deal. This was Sabbath lunch, Sabbath dinner. And other Pharisees are there. Verse 3 of chapter 14 tells us that there were some lawyers there as well, some experts in the law, teachers of the law, scribes. Scribes, lawyers, and Pharisees. This is pretty much an esoteric crowd, an insider crowd. This is the spiritual equivalent of a good old boys network. Uh, they all know one another. They operate around one another. They, they function with one another and probably don't move too far outside of those circles of Pharisees and scribes. And there are two exceptions to the norm of the crowd that day. Jesus, who is not one of their number, and this man who is there with dropsy. And so since this context, this setup begins uh, just before the section that Brent started reading for us, let's go back and read verses 1 through 6 together in Luke chapter 14. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of the man and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will, will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day. And they could make no reply to this. Uh, this man probably was not from among the Pharisees and the lawyers, the scribes. If he had been, it probably would have said so, that he went to the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees and among the other Pharisees and scribes that were there, one of them had this unfortunate medical condition. He's probably not, not among their number. He is an outsider like Jesus, which suggests that maybe he's there in the first place as a setup, as a plant to see what Jesus is going to do on the Sabbath. Will he heal such a man or not? And if that's the case, then there's not much compassion or care in the room other than what resides in the heart of Jesus. It's possible that they were callously exploiting this man for their own purposes, for their, their own ends against Jesus. The condition that he has, while my translation says dropsy in modern terms, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Most scholars suggest that this is probably edema, uh, the accumulation of excessive fluid in the connective tissue and the cavities of the body. It would have put stress and strain and difficulty on various organs and systems for this man. It would have put a strain on his heart, would have put a strain on his lungs, would have put a, stra would have put a strain on his kidney function. This is a sick man. And Jesus is being watched closely. It doesn't sound like 
The Pharisees and scribes are looking at this man with compassion and pity. Their attention is on Jesus. The scrutiny is upon him. He is under the microscope with a critical eye, and every move, every word, is being watched extremely carefully and closely. That's that's a, a difficult situation to be in when you feel that conspicuous, when you feel that, that the eyes of everyone in the room are on you. And I didn't clear this ahead of time, but I, but I need a volunteer. Colin, would you help me out? Would you stand up for just a second? Would everyone please look at Colin? I mean, keep looking at him. Just, just keep looking at him. See what he does. Sorry, I don't want to torture you too long. You can go ahead and sit back down. Um, you know, I told him that all the eyes of the room were on him. Uh, but Jesus knows that. He knows what's going on. He knows the score. He knows the situation. And he also knows what's going on in people's minds. Jesus is here purportedly with this power to heal. Here is this man suffering from this unfortunate physical condition. Let's see what he's going to do on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus just beats him to the punch. He responds, I I love how verse 3, at least in the New American Standard, says Jesus answered. Nobody said anything, but Jesus answers what they're thinking. And they must have been somewhat shocked as their eyes are on him. Maybe they don't think he knows they're looking at him, and suddenly he turns and locks eyes with them. And asks a question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And suddenly the heat's on them. Suddenly they're in the hot seat. And they're in a dilemma. Thinking that they were going to put Jesus in one, now they're in one. Same kind of dilemma when Jesus turns the tables on them and asks them about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? Was it from God or from the earth? And either way, the answer is going to get them in trouble. Either way, the answer here has the potential to get them in trouble. If they say, yes, it's lawful to heal a person of a physical malady on on the Sabbath day, then they're going to be open to charges of encouraging work, effort, labor on the Sabbath. If they say no, then they risk being viewed as cold and heartless, which they were, but if you are cold and heartless, you don't want to advertise it. Okay? So they're stuck. And notice how the text says they kept silent. They chose not to speak. They did not answer. They wisely kept their mouths shut. So Jesus, briefly described by Luke here, Jesus compassionately takes hold of the man, undoubtedly putting his hands on him, maybe on his shoulders, maybe on his arms, and he heals him. I mean, completely heals him. And Luke doesn't go into detail, but you can imagine the response of the man, the gratitude of the man, the praise to God of the man. And Jesus sends him away, probably because he didn't want to be there in the first place. It's almost as if Jesus says, I understand if you don't want to hang around here. If you don't want to stay for the rest of the party, uh, you're, you're dismissed. You can go. And the man leaves. And then Jesus says, which of, you will not have a, which of you will have a son or an ox that falls into a well? Will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. Notice, in the prior instance, they, they chose not to speak. They elected not to speak. Here, it's just impossible. They don't have an answer. They can't answer the statement of Jesus because they know he's right. There would be no debate, there would be no discussion, there would be no controversy if their own child needed assistance, if their own animal even needed assistance. But you see, those are, those are selfish interests, those are self-interest, and self-interest was fine with them on the Sabbath. Interest for others, compassion for others, not so much. So since Jesus has their attention at this point, He just moves on into this parable about receptions, banquets, just uh, as they were participating in that day. I love how it says in verse 7 that he began speaking this parable to the invited guest when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table 
And so while earlier described, Jesus has been the focus of this scrutiny in this close attention, he's been doing some people watching himself. And most of us enjoy people watching it at some, at some point. Maybe it's at the mall, maybe it's at the fair, maybe it's some other venue. You know, you just sit for a little bit and watch people. They think that they're examining Jesus. Jesus has been examining them. Apparently, he had gotten there early enough, was prompt enough in regard to this invitation, that he was there when most of the guests arrived. And he saw what William Hendrickson describes in his commentary as this unseemly scramble for the places of honor, the chief seats, the best seats. In Mark, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 23, verse 6, it describes Jesus commenting on how the Pharisees love the places of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. And you can imagine how they jostled and, and moved and stepped around people and maybe pushed through people to get to the place of honor, which if this setting was like most settings in that time and culture, uh, the table is not a table up on legs with chairs around it. It's a low sitting table shaped like a capital letter U, uh, the triclinium, a three-sided table. And they were reclined on cushions around it. The, the host was normally at the bottom of the configuration in the middle. And the chief seats, the places of honor, were the ones closest to him. So everyone had pushed and shoved and jostled to get close to the host, the leader from among the Pharisees, and others were left to fend for themselves. Have you ever been ticketed on an airplane or had a ticket at a sporting event or a concert? And you're sitting there before the plane takes off or... Uh, the event begins, and you notice there are a lot better seats than where you're sitting. And they're vacant. So you wait for a little while, and you check your watch, you look at the clock, and you think, I bet they're not coming. You know, that seat up there at the bulkhead, that's got a lot more leg room than mine. So I'm going to take a chance. I'm going I'm to move seats. Or you get down closer to the stage, or you get down closer to the field at the ball game. And you just kind of sweat it until the game starts or the plane takes off. And as you see the, the airplane doors being closed and the overhead storage bins being shut, you think you've got it made. And then the flight attendant stands beside you and says, may I see your ticket? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, you're in someone else's seat. You're going to have to move. Or the usher does that at the concert or the ball game. Then you've got that walk of shame back from where you really, really wanted to sit, back to where you, you should have been in the first place. You know, you, you, you've been caught, you, you've been shamed, you've been dishonored. And so as Jesus sees what's going on at the banquet, he addresses the same thing. He says, don't presumptuously take a place of honor lest you be humiliated later and have to move. Take the last place. Take the worst seat with the possibility that perhaps you'll be asked to move up higher. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, Jesus isn't so shallow that his primary concern is social etiquette uh, at parties. While he's addressing that particular situation, that's not why he came to earth, to straighten us out on, on social etiquette. At, at gatherings such as this. Mark Black writes that Jesus' concern is not simply how one behaves at banquets, but rather how he behaves in life. He's talking about the, the heart of humility that is demanded for entrance into the kingdom of God. He's talking about divesting oneself of, of self-interest and considering the needs of others above and beyond our own needs. If characters of heart, if characters of the soul were primary colors, then humility would be red or green or blue, one of those. It's basic. It's essential. It's fundamental to our Christian character. Mark Black continues, uh, Jesus is, is not advising people to take a humble seat at the table as a ploy 
to receive honor at the table. His teaching is that only those who humble themselves in this age will be honored in the age to come. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, you know, just fake it for a while. If you have pride in your heart, if you have arrogance in your heart, if you're motivated to serve out of self-interest, just put, push the pause button for a little bit. Defer that self-interest, you know? De defer uh, that. Take on some false modesty, some false humility. Temporarily take this lower place because you know in the end you're going to be granted the higher position. That's still self-interest. That, that's still arrogance. You're just deferring the end for a short period of time. So Daryl Bach writes in his commentary, Jesus' Jesus's point is not that we should connive to receive greater honor. Rather, he's saying that honor is not to be seized. It is awarded. Jesus is not against giving honor to one who deserves it, but he is against the use of power and prestige for self-aggrandizement. God honors the humble, and the highway of humility leads to the gate of heaven. Those who are truly humble persons recognize their desperate need for God, not any right to blessing. So he shares this parable, and then he says to the one who invited him. I don't know if you picked that up from Brent's reading earlier. But after he talks about this principle of humbling ourselves so that we'll be exalted rather than exalting ourselves and end up being humbled, he went, he went on, this is verse 12, he also went on to say to the one who had invited him. Up to this point, it's just been general discussion, general teaching to there. Now he looks the one who has invited him, the host, in the eye. And says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return. And that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Many of you may remember that uh, film from 1967, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? won two Academy Awards, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, Isabel Sanford. Uh, it, it was a, a daring movie, a courageous movie that dealt with uh, racial prejudice and racial tensions at the very height of the civil rights movement uh, in this country. And the film was recognized for the great movie uh, that it was. But this question, guess who's coming to dinner, really didn't have to be asked that much in Pharisaic circles because they knew who was coming to dinner. The same people who always came to dinner. Other Pharisees and other scribes. And you went to dinners at their house. It was an eternal progressive dinner that just moved from place to place, house to house. It was a supper club that existed among the Pharisees and scribes. Where are we this Sabbath? Oh, we're over at my house. Where are we next Sabbath? Oh, it's, it's, over, at, it's over at Jim's. It's over at, at somebody else's house. And they probably had some rotation worked out, some, some schedule. The invitation for others to come came with this quid pro quo, this for that, something for, for something. And so I'll invite you because you can invite me. You know, you remember from snail mail, the, the, the chain mail that used to come out. Uh, then it was chain email. Uh, th this was a chain meal that just went on and on and on among these same people. The problem was that no one else was ever invited or ministered to, particularly those who didn't have the means, who didn't have the ability to repay the kindness particularly the poor and the disenfranchised in, in society. Jesus isn't saying that it's inherently sinful to host other people, to do good for your friends, your family, your wealthy neighbors, but if that's all we're doing, then we're failing. What's missing here is this ellipsis, this uh, understood thought that's not explicitly stated. We find that in various places in the teaching of Jesus. And if we don't recognize that, we, we tend to misunderstand. He does the same thing in Matthew chapter 6, 
Verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves uh, do not break in or steal. Sometimes people who miss this ellipsis or understood thought, which is merely chiefly or only, might falsely conclude that, well, I, I, don't, I can't store up anything on this earth. Can't have a savings account, can't have any investments, can't prepare for retirement. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying if you only chiefly or mainly store up for yourselves treasures on earth, you're failing. You've missed the boat because those things aren't going to serve you at all in eternity. So store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You find the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 3. When he says to women, your adornment must not be external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. My New American Standard inserts a word into the text that's not in the Greek manuscripts, but it's understood, it's shown in italics, and it's the word merely, which helps our understanding. Your adornment must not be merely external. Brain of hair, wearing of gold jewelry, putting on dresses. If that's your chief, main, or only adornment, then you failed spiritually. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with these imperishable qualities of character and the soul. Without that understanding, there's a prohibition of putting on clothing. Okay? So we know that can't be right. Same thing in 1 John chapter 3. Verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth, taken without that elliptical thought of merely, chiefly, or only, he's telling us we can't tell people we love them. You know, don't love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. No, don't only merely, chiefly, or exclusively love in word or tongue, but primarily, primarily or chiefly by what you do, by how you treat people. So Jesus isn't saying it's inherently wrong to host people who can host you back, but he says if that's all you're doing, then you're failing. What about the poor? What about the crippled? What about the lame? What about the blind? Who is inviting them? Who is providing for those who cannot respond in kind? And that's why I love what we do with the food pantry and what we do with the clothing room and what we're doing through New Heights for 40 days this summer. We are hosting those, we are providing for those, most of whom cannot return the favor and from whom we would never expect it. It's doing good simply for the sake of doing good, not with a view to what I might get in return. So that can't be our motivation. Self-interest as a motivation is out. The values of the kingdom of God apply equally now in the inaugurated kingdom, uh, as it will in the, the consummated kingdom in the there and then. Jesus addressed the same principle in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be uh, sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Do good for the sake of doing good. In whatever form those earthly, uh, excuse me, those heavenly rewards may come, they'll still come as a result of God's goodness and grace, and not as a result of something that God owes us or something that we have somehow earned. We're a few chapters away from John chapter 17, but there he says in verse 10, So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Michael Wilcock writes of the danger of calculating possible rewards as a motivation for the good that we do. He says, real disinterested goodness is rare indeed. So much of what we do is colored by the hope, if not the intention, that it may in some way work out for our own benefit. Such a concern for personal advantage is another thing that will have to go if one is to get through the narrow door. There, more than anywhere, self-interest is inadmissible. The humble aim of the would-be entrant should rather be in the words of the old Latin hymn writer. And here he quotes from this 
old uh, hymn entitled, My God, I Love Thee. It says, My God, I love thee, not because I hope for heaven thereby, nor yet because if I love not, I must forever die. Thou, O my Jesus, thou didst me on the cross embrace, for me didst bear the nails and spear and manifold disgrace. Then why, O blessed Jesus Christ, should I not love thee well? Not for the sake of winning heaven nor of escaping hell, not with the hope of gaining aught, not seeking a reward, but as thyself hast loved me, O everlasting Lord. So would I love thee, dearest Lord, and in thy praise will sing, because thou art my loving God and my eternal King. Loving because he is worthy of our love. Loving as a response for what he has done for us, not merely to escape hell, not merely to escape heaven, but loving him as a blessed and precious Savior and Redeemer. It seems like there was a lot of tension in the room that day. It's, it's not really good social etiquette to talk to your host the way Jesus talked to this man. And so it seems that to break the tension, uh, when Jesus talks about not inviting those who can invite you back, one of the other guests that was reclined at the table, this is verse 15, said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Just to sort of change the subject and maybe to imply that they would be one, the ones who would be eating that bread in the kingdom of God. And that's when he challenges them to make sure that they're going to be there. Because these are among the first invited. Just like we shared with the kids this morning, God has given us all an invitation to join Him in that heavenly kingdom, to, to share in that banquet, in, in the presence of the Father eternally. But Jesus goes on to tell them about a man who invited such people to, to a banquet, to a feast, gave them a heads up, forewarned them, told them that they would be informed when it was prepared, when the food was ready, and Everybody's got an excuse. I've bought some land. I didn't buy just one cow. I bought ten. I've got five yoke of oxen here. Would really like to take them out into the field. Got married. You understand. And those who were invited refused to come. And so the servants were sent out to the, into the highways and the byways to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, those who had been maybe overlooked by some, wouldn't be welcomed by many. It's not time for excuses. It's time for acceptance of Jesus and his kingdom. Whatever you may have been using as either a reason or, a, or as an excuse to, to stand in the way of you accepting Jesus as your Savior, let it, letting those things stand in your way of confessing his name and return, uh, turning from sin and being united with him in baptism, let those things go. Nothing on this earth is worth uh, serving as an excuse to keep us out of that eternal banquet. God loves us. He wants us there. He's invited us there. He allowed his son to die for us that we could be there. If you want to RSVP this morning, we encourage you to do that while we stand and sing together.